All right, we're back with another Lawbringer analysis. Since the last episode we focused on weapons, this one will focus on armor. Now, this is going to be a little bit difficult of a subject because of how complex it'll be when it comes to the history of armor. Most people like Lawbringer because they love the idea of being in a full suit of armor, but is that really what you get with Lawbringer? I'll get more into detail about that in a bit. Like usual, let's start with the helmets. Another thing I was corrected on was that at one point I said Lawbringer's helmet was an armet. Now, it has some few similarities to an armet, but someone told me it was more comparable to a burgeonet. When I looked it up for myself, I'd say, yeah, it's a lot closer to that. More so, that ends up making his helmet period correct to the rest of his armor, but we'll get to that when we move on to the rest of his armor. Back to helmets. For the most part, they're pretty good shape-wise. They all have a nice size to them, and some of them even have fluting, which isn't just decoration, it also increases the helmet's structural integrity. Before I start getting into all the types of helmets, let me get out my obligatory disclaimer of every piece of goddamn armor in this game has a ridiculous amount of rust on it. I hate it. Alright, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to talk about only noteworthy helmets because some of them are just... meh. Also, I usually pick the best, but in this case I can't. I really don't know which one would be the best realistically in this situation. That being said, I'm going to go over the ones that I think are the best out of all the helmets and just talk about the downsides and upsides of each one. Let's start with the default helmet, also known as the Deneb helmet. I really like this helmet. I think the holes in the helmet, also known as the breaths, are a perfect size that give just enough ventilation with enough protection as well. The cross design on them is really appropriate for the armor and the setting the armor comes from. The fluting on the back along with the center ridge really gives off that late medieval early renaissance feel to it. This would hands down be the best helmet in all of his kit if it wasn't for one glaring issue. How the hell does he see out of that thing? Those breaths do not count as a slit to see out of, they're made intentionally small on purpose. There is no way he'd be able to see with that few openings, and no way he'd be able to effectively see in a battlefield sense with this. Now I want to talk about the Zelos, Nobright, Feldar, and Void Cage all at the same time. It's just easier to do it this way because I have to say the same thing for all of these. They all don't have eye slits as well, and rely on their ventilation slits to see. Normally, I would say that this would not be a good idea because of the fact that the bigger you make your ventilation, the more you will compromise on how much the helmet protects your face. Well, that's what I would have said until I found this. This Bergenet not just has an intricate and wide open ventilation, but it also uses said ventilation to see out of. This is a piece at the Met Gallery and honestly, I don't know anything about it. It doesn't say if it's for parades or if it was for combat. It doesn't say if it was refurbished either, but from the looks of it, it doesn't have any sort of noticeable wear and tear that any item that was actually used on a battlefield would have. So really, I guess it means that these helmets could have been possible, but I'd think that it'd be the exception and not the norm. Lastly, let's talk about the Darash and the Steel Watcher Helm. Both of them are along the lines of what a helmet should look like. The breaths are a bit large, I wish they were more like the default helm, but it's not the worst. The isolate is probably a bigger issue. I would usually say it's much too large and it would probably be a detriment to the protection of the user. Again, that is until I found this. As you can see, there are multiple different variants of the Bergenets throughout history based on which region they were made or what for. That's what makes history interesting and also kind of difficult because you end up thinking that you know a thing or two and then you end up realizing you're completely wrong. Well, that's why we do research beforehand. The one thing I can say that I don't agree with at all is the attachment strap system on the Darash helmet. That is very archaic and would not be exposed on a late period helm like that. Not just because it could take damage from attacks and come off, but more likely than not, the exposed leather would be damaged over time to the elements. Watch me say that and then get proven wrong. Listen, a lot of my expertise is in weapons, sword specifically for the most part. This is a learning experience for me too. Alright, I think we spent enough time on the helmets, so let's move on to the rest of the armor. Let's start with the arms. I'm not picking favorites or anything like that because they're pretty much all the same. With the newer arms, you can see that the chainmail stops at a short sleeve length, and you can see that there's a gamison underneath. That's fine. It's totally plausible that someone would do that more often than not. They're just trying to protect exposed parts like armpits where you could very easily stab someone in their heart, arteries, or other vitals like lungs depending on how deep you stab. One thing that they all have that is just awful are the shoulder plates or pauldrons. They are freaking massive, way larger than wardens. 
I understand that Ubisoft did want it to make it look large, bulky, and intimidating to fit the stereotype of a knight, but now I am here to tell you that it's just ridiculous. What's so funny is that if you look closely, underneath the pauldrons are spaulders. Historically correct spaulders at that. See how it fits snug up against his arm so that no shrapnel or weapons could get underneath? That's how pauldrons are supposed to sit on someone's shoulders. Snug, not moving. Armor is supposed to be custom fit to the person wearing them. Think of it this way. Would you go backpacking with a backpack that slouches all the way down your back and swings the weight around whenever you hike? I wouldn't. Now think about someone who had to march in a full plate harness or ride a horse at full speed while their pauldrons are clanking around. The elbow pads have the same problem, way too large. You can see in the pictures of historical armor that the plate fits snug to almost create a silhouette of the user who wears it. I do really like the gauntlets though. It fits the 16th century feel that they're going for with this character. Speaking of the 16th century feel, let's move on to chess pieces, which actually covers everything from the torso down. First, let's talk about what 16th century armament is like and who it was for. Coming up on the late 16th century, which is the 1500s, gunpowder was becoming the new form of warfare. No longer was it pikes and bows and swords and shields, it was now about shooting people and an extremely heavy emphasis on cavalry. This caused militaries to adapt. There were fully armored knights and heavy armor cavalry called the gendarme. My French is extremely poor and I probably butchered that. And then there were light armor cavalry as well. Now the light armored cavalry that existed for only the late 16th century to early 17th century was known as the demi lance. These would be outfitted with what you might see on a knight's plate harness, but outfitted to work for a quicker and lighter cavalry more. That means they had a burgeonette, but no visor. They had a full upper body armor, but no leg protection. They would have thick leather riding boots instead. Now, this is contrary to a knight or a gendarme in the way that they would protect themselves from head to toe. They would have a visor and they would have an entire full wrap around leg protection, but all that plate armor would soon phase out as firearms became the way of the future. But specifically the breastplate and some other pieces would stick around for quite a bit of time. Debatably, you could even say that it evolved into modern day body armor now. To get back on track, you might be wondering why I'm explaining all of this, and that's because the Lawbringer sits somewhere between a Demi Lance and a Gendarme. So when looking at the armor, I will again not go into detail with any specific piece because they're all generally the same. I will mention the differences between the original armor style and the new armor style, but even then, they share a lot of similarities. Starting with the actual chest itself, we see on a lot of the original armor that it's a single breastplate with some sort of plate bever attached to the breastplate itself. Whether it's riveted, welded, or an actual piece of the breastplate itself, it isn't too far-fetched as a possibility. By the 16th century, bevers have been around for hundreds of years, and using plate armor to protect a vital area like the neck makes sense. The problem I have with it is how far away it is. Now, we see protection like this where it sticks far away from the neck and is actually attached to the cuirass itself, but well, that was usually for tournament jousting to protect the riders. It wouldn't be as practical on a battlefield as plate armor has advanced to an incredible amount by then. As you can see in these photos of the 16th century suits of armor, the neck protection goes flush up against the neck which provides much better protection from any direction unlike the bever that's attached to the cuirass. What's funny is the new armor pieces, there's no bever at all. They just decided to scrap the neck protection I guess. It's alright. Jugular arteries are overrated anyways. I would like to say that the breastplate is very form-fitting, which is good. It tapers at the waist, which is what you want. Otherwise, whenever you'd bend down, you'd push your armor into your neck. The problem the new armor has looks like it doesn't fit our friend here. The plates don't meet up, which seems like a major oversight considering how vulnerable rib cages are and how powerful lances and guns are. It's made too small, Your Grace. It won't go. Your mother was a dumb whore with a fat ass. Did you know that? Look at this idiot. One ball and no brains. He can't even put a man's armor on him properly. Be too fat for your armor. Fat? Fat, is it? Is that how you speak to your king? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's funny, is it? No, Your Grace. No? 
You don't like the hands joke? It's usher in the poor boy. You heard the hand. The king's too fat for his armour. Go find the breastplate stretcher. Now! <laughs> the breastplate stretcher? How long before he figures it out? The original armor covers the entire torso area though, so that's good. All of the newer armors come with a medieval stamp belt. It's a bit late era for something like this, so I'm starting to believe that their inspiration for the newer armors were from earlier centuries. That would corroborate with Warden's armor as well, and would make sense for a lot of things like short sleeve mail, the cuirass, and the belt. He also has what looks like the Singula Militare that we talked about in the Centurion analysis. As far as I understand, that was an Imperial Roman Empire thing, so I don't know why he has it. Moving on, we have the side hip armor known as Folds. They don't match. Not a single one makes them identical. It's also debatable how much protection they'll actually provide considering that they don't have any sort of additional protection underneath. That and it looks like they're barely strapped in and you can clearly see that there's a gap between the folds and the breastplate. The newer type of armor doesn't even have them at all and decided to opt for what looks like a studded leather skirt, I guess. Although the newer ones had their chainmail hauberk come down to about mid-thigh, so that's definitely more leg protection than the original armor sets. Speaking of leg protection, the original sets have nothing for the thighs at all. The thigh area is probably some of the largest targets, and are home to some pretty important arteries, so you'd think he'd wear some sort of male chaucis or something. It then goes down to some ridiculously bulky knee protection, Although one thing I will say is that they have side of the knee protection, which is really good because the side of the knee is an easy target that could completely immobilize a person who gets slashed there. If only he were wearing full leg protection to prevent from any of that. One thing I would commend is the greaves and the sabatons. It looks like full shin, calf, and foot protection. The foot looks like it barely exposes the tip, which is bad, but it could be worse. It could be warden. It looks like all the leg armor is held up by jury rig straps though. I don't know why Ubisoft loves exposed leather straps so much. If we look at the newer style of armor, then to our shock and awe, it might be the first person in four armor to actually have thigh armor. It's also a little comforting to see that the pants are at least padded, so that's a bit more protection I suppose. The knee pads also aren't comically large this time, but they're also not that smaller. Flush up against the user look is what we're looking for. It definitely takes a turn for the worse here though. The greaves only cover half the calves at most now. Also the sides of the knees are a bit more exposed now. And to top it all off, their sad attempt at a sabaton looks like it's from Party City and you will most likely snag on something on the battlefield rather than it actually protecting you. Last thing I'll touch on is the capes for the newer armors. I talked about this in the warden analysis as well. In short, sure, you could wear a cape like that, maybe even for parade use or something, but realistically it doesn't help you and there are much better ways to display your colors like the standards that the Lawbringer wears or maybe even a surcoat. Now if you were marching and you wanted something to protect your armor from the elements or something to keep you warm, then a cloak might be what you're looking for, but that would wrap around you almost like a blanket and you would not want to wear that in combat. I actually own a large wool cloak and I can tell you that it will fall down and get in your way if you try to fight in it. Alright, since we have the time, let's talk about emotes and signatures. This is going to be very short as there's nothing really to talk about. In the emotes we have your welcome, which I suppose is a more proper way to salute at the beginning of duel, which makes me wonder why it isn't the default as opposed to my liege, which is a more formal recognition of holding your weapon with your arm across your body, like that is something that you would do in a normal parade setting. I believe even some militaries still do this while marching, but don't quote me on that. We then have Mach de Vertut, which if you didn't know what that meant, you might think the motion the Lawbringer is doing is some sort of taunt, when in reality it means well done, or in a more literal sense, be blessed for your courage. Just something to think about next time you think someone is trying to BM you at the beginning of a duel. For the sharper edge signature, don't do that. This legitimately gives me anxiety. If you plan on sharpening an edge, put it on a sturdy surface, and that doesn't just have to do with safety. Without a sturdy surface, you might not be grinding out a sharper edge, you might be dulling it even more. Also, don't jerk your hand like he does, you'll lose a finger that way. For the Vincent Veritas signature, I don't know why it's like that. 
Vincit Veritas means either truth prevails or truth conquers, but most popularly known as the former. Don't know what has to do with the signature, but it looks cool. Finally, we have ipso jure, which means by the law itself. I don't think this really needs any explaining. Alright, so I think that's going to be it. Both part 1a and 1b have probably been the most difficult out of all of the analysis so far because of just how little I know of late medieval and early renaissance warfare. And the things that I do know tend to get muddled into different eras. So I hope this was good enough. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or late medieval and early renaissance history you'd like to share, feel free to leave it down below. I make an active effort to check all the comments and respond to them if necessary. If you like the video, then leaving a like would be much appreciated. If you want to see part 2 of this video and or other videos like it, the best thing you could do would be to subscribe. I upload these videos kind of irregularly due to how much research and work goes into writing, recording, and editing. But with all that said, thank you so very much for watching and I hope you have a great day.